Hey, how's it going? Hey there, Jerry. Matt Winston is the son of Stan Winston, the the brilliant artist, genius, filmmaker, um, and um, gosh, I mean, he was he, he. Your father encompassed so many things. Um, I wouldn't even really know how to. Um, I mean, how do you label somebody that's done so much? Um, uh, a Renaissance man. I don't know. A jack yeah. of all trades. A um, a polymath. A um, a capable individual, a uh, boundary breaker. Yes, uh, I don't know. He he really never uh, confined himself to anything. He was always thinking, "Cool, I just did that." Yeah. What's more fun than doing that again? Is doing something new and challenging, and he thrived on that. So that's why he he dabbled in so much. It, it was uh, just because it was fun to to do something new. That was his entire career was about doing something new. You know, your your dad meant so much to me. Um, really been important in my life. Um, and and the thing is, is like anybody who like it was like when Terminator came out and he did the Terminator, the giant silver uh, robot. I mean, I was like, that's it, that man. He that is it. And then Jurassic Park comes along and he builds a full size. Tyrannosaurus Rex. I said, "Okay, now that's it." You know, it just it just went, every every time he did something, it was just you know, like the Queen Bee and aliens uh, and aliens. I was just like, you know, oh, that's it. You know, it's it yep. just unbelievable. And uh, I, I know that when you go out, you're, I can I can see from the videos, especially when you go out and do panel stuff for like a, um, the Predator video. If anyone, yeah, that's on our, our YouTube channel. Um, the Predator twenty fifth reunion panel we did at Monster Palooza is there, um, featuring uh, the crew, most of the crew who were, who were there on on the Predator uh, set back in nineteen eighty five. I love that video. That is just a, I've watched that twice, um, and it's fun to see all these uh, the guys getting back together. And you know, I always imagine that there was probably fights or, you know, oh, I don't really care for this guy. And then all that time goes by and you come back and you say, you know what? I was the dick. <laughs> you know, I was the one that was, you know, the I was the asshole. But now, you know, but everybody. When you're in your, when you're in your 20s, yeah. you, you realize what a, a dick you really are. <laughs> right. Just by the very nature of the decade you are occupying. It's just kind of like self-centered and you don't see. Yeah. And I. But I'm only saying that because I'm an old man and I'm trying to make myself feel better about that. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, by the way, I want to correct because um, our fans and our students are gung-ho about everything. And I just said 85 talking about Predator and I'll get played for oh, that. Oh, no, that's right. That was 87. So. Oh, shit, I can't believe you messed up like that. I'm keeper of the facts. And uh. You know how how we how are we to trust you now with information? I, I just recently watched Trek Nation, um, the documentary about um, Gene Roddenberry's son, where he um, you know goes back and is trying to you know uh, find out about his dad because when he was in his teens, when he's seventeen, he kind of rebelled against his dad, and you just and, and the thing is, I rebelled against my dad. My dad was like a tough you know guy. He was like a jerk and. And then, you know, when he was old, you know, he had Alzheimer's and he was frail and I felt sorry for him. And, and then it was like too late to even try to, you know, connect with him, you know, because he had, you know, he, he was had Alzheimer's and he would, he didn't know who I was, you know, but he was, you know, so I, I just think, you know, it, it's got to be interesting to have someone like your father do all these amazing things. And you know that you're surrounded by kids your age that are digging it, but are you really into it? You know what I'm saying? It's like. Is there a- um, yeah, I've always been uh, the biggest fan of my dad. Always, number. I've always been his and his team's number one fan. Um, I'm a bit of an almanac of information about his career. You know, every night he'd come home from the shop and we sit at the dinner table. And I'd say, "What'd you do today, Dad?" And that was such a pleasure for me. And I got to do it growing up. Uh, that was my summer job, and and I. Did it for a year after college. Even I started to learn uh, digital, um, the digital tools back in the early '90s, and I was digging it. But you know, from a very early age, I I wanted to be an actor more, mm. um, like five, and I'd see my dad, you know, kill himself in our in Stan Winston Studio, which was then our garage, and he'd be working so hard and doing mold. I mean, 
creature effects is really hard work. You know, the design is fun with the pencil, but then it's hard work. It's molds and fumes and poisons and yeah. heavy lifting. Go to the set and all this awesome stuff he made got to go on the actors and they got to do it. And I was like, I want to do that. Come on. But, uh, I did always love what he did. So there was never a similar to Roddenberry. Not my, my situation was that completely I, different. Yeah. A huge fan of it. Um, but chose for my focus to be an actor, which was actually my dad's now, dream. That's the thing that I, I always loved hearing about is that he, you know, he, he wanted to be an actor and, uh, you know, and and he certainly he's charismatic. I mean, just just looking at pictures and you see him, he said, "Yeah, that guy, he, he could have been like a great." Actor. I mean, you know, and then and then finding out that well, the makeup thing started as sort of a part time thing to make money until he could get the acting gigs. And exactly. Th- yep. He, his dream was to, you know, he started playing, you know, monster at a very young age. He was really. He admired um, Lon Chaney, Sr. and Jr., and obviously, uh, you know, J- the work of Jack Pierce and what Boris Karloff did with it. And he really envisioned being the guy wearing the monster makeup and being a famous guy like that. Uh, Lon Chaney never, you know, uh, my persona is Stan Winston, but a famous character actor along those lines. That's what he dreamed of. Yeah. And that's what got him into makeup was making himself up to college. And, and he, uh, he, um, became the makeup guy for the theater troupe there. He was also in the troupe, but he kept became the makeup guy. He started oh, wow. to tell me he was good at it, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, he always had that in his back pocket. And when acting didn't work out, he, he said, Hey, I love that as well. And it keeps me in the business. And, um, I'll do that. I just think about like a man of a thousand faces, the, uh, James Cagney thing. When I was a kid and I, I saw the thing where, you know, it was like the well. I guess it was before the depression, but it was, things were really bad. And he was trying to be, you know, that job as an actor, like the uh, well, like extras or something like that. And he knew that if he could fix himself up to look like an Indian or you know or some other or, or a deformed person or something, he'd get the he'd get the job out of that cattle call. And mm-hmm. and I really, for, you know, when I saw that movie as a kid, I thought that's the way, you know, I thought that's the way it really was, you know. And I always thought, like, wow, why couldn't someone, like, like it must have been, I imagine your father probably thought, yeah, that would be the way to do it. But it's not really, it doesn't really work that way anymore, does it? Well, certainly not anymore. But, um, you know, actors, I, I personally have gone in on auditions where, you, you know, you don't go overboard and, like, come in as a hunchback with a big fake nose. I mean, then they're going to be like, whoa, easy now. <laughs> you, know, you don't have the job yet. I think you put a little too much, you know, uh, energy into this before it's a done deal. But, you know, a yeah. little bit is good. You know, I've gone in with a fake mustache. I've gone in um, with something that suggests a wardrobe. But, yeah, not many people are going in to audition for the werewolf movie. <laughs> <laughs> Full werewolf prosthetic. It's like, no, we... We're actually going to hire people to do that. <laughs> I had these friends that would just go on auditions all the time just so that they would stay in the motion or whatever, you know. And uh, and they were always, you know, booking movies and TV shows and pilots and things that they didn't really – and they always got it because it wasn't – they didn't really have anything invested in it. You know, the ones you want it – was... yeah, it's, it's really true with anything in life. The, the more you focus on the result, you know, getting the job or getting the girl or getting anything – the less likely it is it's going to happen. You, you know, you can know that's there, but you really have to focus on enjoying the doing of the thing and, you know, why I, I think I've fortunately uh, was able to work for so long. And, you know, yeah. as an actor is that I did go into auditions with that attitude. This is just an opportunity to do a, a two minute little play right. uh, and perform and, and give a good feeling to this uh, small audience of people so that, you know, if I'm the, uh, what they want, Great. Um, and if I'm not, they'll have a good memory of um, a playful person that came in. So, you know, that's true of really any, any art. Is you got to focus on uh, the moment and not worry so much about getting the thing. Now, I'm, when I was a kid, I, was for, <laughs> I went through this period where I was kind of obsessed with um, uh, Cornell Wilde movies. <laughs> and I don't know why. It sounds kind of scary. Uh, but I loved Gargoyles. When Gargoyles came out, I thought, like, that was my show. I, I was at the right age, and it, and I just, I just loved that show. I was like, I remember seeing your dad's name in the credit, and it was like, okay, this is a, this is a name to remember. And I still, and I saw that movie not long ago, and it, it, it is, it, it is dated, but it still feels, you know, it still feels good. That movie, that movie works, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, the, that was a turning point for him. That little TV movie. It was a big deal. Um, that was his first uh, project after leaving uh, his apprenticeship at, at Disney. You know, he it was his first sort of uh, stepping out on his own uh, project, and he uh, he was an audacious dude. You know, he did great work, but he he came on as Sonny Berman's assistant, and he uh, he insisted on on credit, and he insisted on being acknowledged. And uh, wow. This was something that really set him apart in a big way throughout his career, is insisting on uh, being recognized for the work. And, you know, soon other artists said, wow, yeah, we, we should be on a poster. We're providing the star of the movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his first job out of the gate, he had that same kind of, you know, on the one side, artistic ambition, but on the other side, business ambition. Um, so that was a big movie for him. It's probably so primitive the way... It- you know, with what he had to deal with, with the budget and what they had to use. But um, I was thinking about that scene where they go in and there's all these, um, there's all these, uh, you know, eggs of all the gargoyles. And, and they, I think they torch them, right? Oh, yeah. And that's, isn't that just like, um, that's just like aliens. I mean, he must have, when he was working on aliens, said, hey, you know what? This, I did this in gargoyles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, those, uh, the choice to torch the eggs wasn't dads in aliens. That was part of... Uh part of Jim Cameron's uh, screenplay. Right. Um, so Jim wasn't involved with Gargoyle. You know, it's just funny. Although you know how, you know, how it is in, you know how it is in, in, in sci-fi, there are a certain finite number of sort of visual reference points that stretch all the way back to, you know, Greek times or whatever. Um, you know, the mother and her brood, the, you know, the, yeah. all this stuff. So um, everyone borrows freely imagery from from whatever, and gargoyles turns out is the inspiration for aliens, and now it can be told. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I when, I remember I was like into stop motion animation as a kid, and I, there was this you know article, and I think I don't know if it was Willis O'Brien, but I, I know I'm pretty sure it was uh, Ray Harryhausen that had one of the T Rexes. Um, he had a bladder inside, and he could pump it up a little bit so that it looked like the um, uh, the dinosaur was breathing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then there's, there's that great scene where, um, you know, the Triceratops, boy, I used to know all my dinosaurs, but now in Jurassic Park where it's sitting there and the stomach is inflating. And I just got the same thrill, you know, seeing that. And then, um, you know, just it just took me back to when I was a kid, you know, watching uh, those stop motion films. And Oh, yeah. The, those have such, they still have magic when you look at them because, you know, they're handcrafted. You know that they were... They're really there. They're there. And whether they're, whether you buy them as real or not, you know they are real in a way. They are three-dimensional objects that some craftsperson, you know, and Ray Harryhausen was remarkable in, in his, in striving to bring, you know, reality to those puppets and give them musculature and study the way physics works and how, uh, you know, the body, how you could create a fight scene that feels like it has weight. Yeah. Um, he was truly, I mean, before, um, you know, and then Phil Tippett took that uh, even further with, with, I mean, Dragon, uh, Dragon Slayer. Oh, my God. Oh, I know that. It's just, I love that. That go motion. Oh, incredible. And then, you know, that's, that was just getting more and more refined. But what was making it special was those things, those touches, you know, bringing the movement of skin or breathing. And, and then, you know. CG took a really took over the lion's share of the work, you know, but stop motion was it. If you needed a full scale, realistic uh, creature in your movie, that was the only way you could really pull it off. Uh, you know, until dad started making full size T-Rexes. Yeah. And no, I see I just went through, I, CG, I uh, came in as well. I, I just went through a, a huge spell of just going through your dad's filmography with my wife showing her uh, movies and stuff. And we were, you know, we were watching Jurassic park again and I just love the scene where the T-Rex's foot steps on the, um, into the mud a little bit, but you see, you see the, you know, the weight. And it was like, yep. he, he, it's like, he says, you know what? Cause it's stop motion. You don't really get that sense. I mean, if there is any sense of weight, it's an illusion. And of course, I guess that's what your dad was doing as well as an illusion, but, but it, it really sold it for me because C, CG can look so light, you know? And yes. It's, it's, it, it, it is an illusion, but what physical, uh, effects and, and live characters have that CG doesn't have inherently is a physical presence to them and an actual weight to them. So it didn't have to be an animator didn't have to come up with that idea that the, that the foot would sort of squish out and yeah. roll in that way. That wasn't something that had to be 
um, pre vised and everything else. That was just a big ass, heavy, real leg pressing down its own weight. And it's those kinds of sort of real world givens that practical just has, you know, it's like, yeah, lights actually hitting it. Water's actually hitting it. It actually jumped on that actor. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, you know, a lot that physical can't do, but there's some stuff that physical will always be able to do better because it's actually happening. Yeah, I would think for an actor, I mean, you you see like the stuff um, that, you know, Peter Jackson and them do where they, you know, they do the, um, what is it, like the body motion? What is it called? Uh, Motion capture. Yeah, motion capture, performance capture. Yeah, and even, and like, I would think as an actor, boy, you're really just, it, it, that's like playground stuff. You're just having to, you really having to be picturing it in your head. But, you know, stuff like the practical stuff, like uh, your dad and you know, other people do, they can actually just, the actors don't even really have to act. They can just react to, I mean, you know, I just think that, you know. Well, that is something that dad always, always talked about when, you know, people asked him about the advantages of having something on set that, a, that an actor can perform with. And, you know, he just would go to the standard, which is so true, which is great acting, is reacting, yeah. is feeding off the person you're in the scene with. If it's two people disconnected doing monologues and not, you know, there's that dance between two people, even in any subtle conversation. You take in what you're given, and that informs what you do. And, you know, that's not to say there aren't great actors um, who can't imagine it. Uh, they're on set with nothing. They have great skill, and they can imagine it. That that doesn't say that there aren't great directors who can coach it out of an actor in the moment, saying, now it's coming up to you. Yeah. Now it's really big. Imagine it's big. Sure, they can do this. But what you have to rely on then is imagination and not the reality of having something there that actually affects you um, for real. Uh, it takes one step out of it. And the other thing it gives you having something on set is, you don't have to follow the storyline that the writer came up with or that you can imagine. Things are going to happen when a, when a live creature's in the room. When you have an actor in a suit, you can come to set and you'll find stuff. And the performance will always win when you give actors that kind of tool. Always, always. You know, another thing about your dad that I was always impressed with, you know, when I was a kid, it was the... Um you know, there was a lot of guys in suits, you know, even like, um, you know, the um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, what were those, um, Land at Time for God or whatever, you know, it was... Or the, the Morlocks or, or, yeah. Yeah, or, and those guys, yeah, and those guys... H.G. Wells, that's H.G. Wells, that's on, um, uh, again, I'm switching things up. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? It's like they had, there were guys that were dressed like dinosaurs, and, and as a kid, it's like, well, you know, I always knew it was a guy in a suit, but, sure. but the thing that your dad did and again if i'm wrong correct me but it was like hey let's take the human body let's see what kind of position the human body can be in and let's try to build something around it and then i was thinking about the raptors because there there's a lot of shots where the raptors are practical there there's a guy in a suit and it, it's amazing yes that was actually um what really s- took dad's career into uh, the place it went was his focus. He took his focus away from character makeups and characters that were built on the human form as suits and as makeups. And he started to experiment with going beyond that, those limitations, um, incorporating puppetry, animatronics, and other performance techniques in addition to, you know, people inside suits. And, and yes, that was so what made him uh, different at that time. He really pushed that area. And really, all credit goes to Jim Henson. Um, I remember distinctly seeing that Dark Crystal with Dad and him being blown away at the Skeksis and how how Henson took the the inherent non-humanoid thing he was already doing with the Muppets and gave it a realistic finish, you know, and realistic motion. And he was like, whoa, the Skeksis blew his mind and those still walking creatures and all the ways that Henson got away from the limitations of a humanoid car- uh, actor inside. And that changed dad's trajectory. And he, he used it that same year on the thing. Um, the dog thing he created was oh. inspired by the Skeksis, uh, hand puppet, um, cleverly, you know, hidden yeah. uh, and everything T- Terminator was inspired by the backpack rigs. Dad saw Henson using to, Replicate, uh, re- replicate character gate from an actor to a puppet. 
Um, but yeah, that was getting outside the human constraints was really what he was all about after that period of time. Uh, I, I just got to say, um, Matt, when uh, I've been a subscriber to the Stan Winston School of Character Arts uh, YouTube page, and also I've, I, I get your, I just, I get the um, you know, almost daily, um, um, you know, tutorial uh, previews that you guys sent out. And you're really good about, you know, sending that stuff out, and I enjoy them. And I was just telling, I was talking with. Uh, um, I was talking about uh, Steve Wang. Uh, he's a Facebook friend, and I wish you were a face. I don't know why you haven't. I've been, I've been trying to add you for years. You're just not on Facebook anymore. I know. I'm, I'm there. I'm available, but I've heard about you, and I, so I blocked you a long time ago. Oh, yeah, I know why. That's the thing is, I'm always, pl- I'm always plugging you guys. <laughs> hey, man, it takes a lot to friend me on Facebook. <laughs> No, no, we'll do it after. Let's sidebar that, and you want to become <laughs> Facebook friends after this podcast. Your dad, there's a video of your dad that is so touching. I mean, actually, a lot of the videos, you know, there's a lot of stuff of him, you know, behind the scenes where they're doing, you know, they're testing things, you know, they're trying to see how it looks, you know. Your dad would just get so thrilled with, um, you know, with his team uh, is walking around, and your dad John, is thrilled. John, oh, who that was? John Rosen. Sorry. Oh, yeah. And... Your, the, the look on your dad's face, he was like a kid. I mean, it was so great. Um, I just I just love stuff well, like he that. Was, I mean, he was truly, I mean, he was Dr. Frankenstein mixed with Santa Claus. That's truly his job description. I mean, he, um, once it uh, got out of our house, you know, Stan Winston Studio was a garage until about 78, uh, um, 77, 78, and then... He jumped around and got his, you know, little bit of shop space and other shops. And then when he got his own place and he started surrounding himself with other artists and, and uh, really building a team, um, it, uh, it was great because he could stand back a little bit then and enjoy and, and walk around and, and go to each elves workbench and say, what is this amazing creature you've got going here? And they would show him and he could just, be blown away. I mean, be impressed every day by the greatest artists in the world. And then he could give his two cents and they would make the adjustments and he would guide the show. But he truly was a, as big a fan as anyone else. And every day his walk through his shop was the highlight of his day to go through and say, Hey genius in engineering, show me the thing you just invented. Hi, world's greatest sculptor. Let me see this, you know, uh, 40 foot long dinosaur you've sculpted. You know, it, and he knew it. He's like, I have the greatest job in the world. And, and he did. And I got to be uh, along for the ride. It was pretty pretty special. You know, there's so many people that have gone on to be Academy Award winners and, and, uh, and, and great artists themselves that were, you know, on, on your dad's team, uh, you know, or, you know, when they're on their way up to the whole thing. And the thing that's so great is that they still have so many wonderful things to say about them. And I was thinking about, you know, Steve Wang said this thing, and, it, and it's where... You know, he was making the stuff for your dad, and he was doing the stuff that your dad wanted. But he was just like Steve himself was going like, because I guess he was like twenty, maybe nineteen or twenty, and he's like saying, "Yeah, I'm, you know, this isn't what I wanted. You know, this like I didn't, I, I'm not enjoying the process." And your dad took him aside and said, "Hey, it's okay. You can enjoy the process. You don't have to hate everything." Because you know, like, I, and I'm, I'm that guy. I mean, I know what that's like. I always, I, it's like. I'm embarrassed to en- to say that I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And, right. and your dad took him aside at the pivotal point in his, you know, his age and said, Hey, you know what? You can enjoy the process. It's okay to let yourself enjoy it. And, and when I saw Steve uh, say that, I just like, wow, I wish I had, I wish your dad had told me when I was 17, you know, that, and it just, that's what makes your dad so special is that there are so many people that are not like that. And, um, uh, I just, I don't know. You, uh, you hit it on the head with him. I mean, his core, and this is something I said it, when we laid him to rest, because it, it can be applied to any human being on the planet. His core of, of why he was so successful, it, whether it had been selling cars or, or food or whatever else, he would be he would be successful because his mantra and what he taught me and everyone who ever worked for him and why they all went on to great success is, do what you love. Success will follow. That's it. Wow. Just do what you love because you will do that better than anything else. Anything you do that you don't love, you will not do well. And, and that was it. 
And, you know, so when my friends who were raised in maybe more pessimistic households looked at me pursuing an acting career or founding a school online or whatever, or they look at me with a raised eyebrow and I, I look back at them and say, it's too fun not to succeed. Wow. We're having too much fun. And so that was Stan all over. Um, fun with what you're doing and you will do it so much better. Well, the thing I love is that he was really on top of it as far as documenting, you know, every step along. You know, he was, he was I would think, pretty much in the forefront. I would imagine a lot of guys probably didn't want to, you know, they probably didn't want to, I guess they wanted to have some sort of mystique about it. But, but how great is it that you've got the school going and you have this archive of thousands of hours of stuff, of behind the scenes stuff of your dad making things? Well, it's interesting. The Stan Winston School in some ways grew out of two things. One was that we were sitting on literally, like you said, thousands and thousands of hours of behind-the-scenes footage of the making of all the characters that came out of the shop. Um, we also had a hole in our hearts. You know, those are the two factors. We knew we wanted to share that stuff, but we thought, you know, Dad, we want him to feel alive, and just putting out an archival site feels so... Just wasn't it cool then? So it didn't feel right until we came up with the, the idea to get into education online. We're like, great. Now these can be used in an educational context, in a looking forward context, in a it's not over. You know, if you're here watching this, it's because you love this. Yeah. You're here the tools you need to now go do this. Um, so, yeah, having all of this um, and the fact that he documented it and was so... Uh, smart about that and realized what he was doing. You know, he, he, he never thought uh, what they were doing wasn't worthy. He thought what they were doing was equivalent to the feats Michael, uh, Michelangelo was pulling off yeah. in chapel. That's how he felt about what they were doing. And I think he always felt it was a worthy art form and uh, deserved to be documented. And I've known so many people, especially listeners and friends that have, have taken, you know, who have taken or who have signed on as, uh, at the, at the school, just that shows me that, uh, that, that enthusiasm, you know, that enthusiasm didn't pass away. It, it, and, and you, and all, all these people that, gosh, you know, I, I mean, I hate to be emotional, but I, you know, some of that stuff just really, you know, I can, I could just easily cry, you know, and, um, I'm embarrassed to say that, but it, some of the, some of the tutorial, you know, not necessarily the tutorials, but the, just when the people get to, have their response about your father. Um, and, uh, well, I, I, this, this, uh, honestly at the very base of it and why it's growing so, um, beautifully and rapidly and why so many artists are flocking to this endeavor is that it is one born out of emotion and love and whether it's that they love dad personally because they knew him and miss him and want to give back to him some of the inspiration or give back to, uh, I, I would say fans worldwide through his name, the inspiration they were given by the work he did, or, or, or whether it's they're not personal connections, but that he is associated with characters that have a real resonance with people. You know, remembering the first time you saw a dinosaur and believing they actually had to be real. Yeah. Um, the love that is wrapped up in this thing, you know, is insane. I mean, that's where it came from. It, it literally... I, I have never in my life dreamed of running a school of any kind. I was content to be a lazy actor, and I, I would work, you know, once or twice a month and work on fun shows and be that guy I got to watch when I was five years old who got to, and I got to wear the makeup myself. Great. But he died, and it was like, whoa, that's our Pied Piper. That's our chief. That's our, what do we do? You know, miss that energy in our lives and, by by replugging into the world he loved so much and that he helped build, it's it's given us him back, you know. And so yeah. it, it's a, it's so emotional for us, and it's a it's run by my family and my best friends. Yeah. Um, my brother in law Eric Litoff is my partner in this. He and I run it, and um, and uh, my nieces and nephews are on alert to take it over when we kick it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. No, they, no, I say they say you know you must keep your grandpa's name alive because it means more than just one man. It, it means a, a, a well of fun and inspiration and character creation. Um, the other thing that I want to just you know, since you got me on a roll here, yeah. The thing that I 
mourned also in not just his passing was the vision of a day when people would not make 40 foot tall live acting T-Rex puppets. Like how is it possible that that day could be over? Um, now I understand, you know, the limitations of film budgets and the efficacy of using CG for certain stuff, but I was so lucky, along with all the crew and the people who were there, to be on the stage in, at Warner Brothers when that T-Rex was fired up, standing right in front of it, a few feet away, and it looking at me, and I'm walking over here, and it's following me with its gaze and cocking its head and behaving with me. It was the most visceral, thrilling experience I've ever had in my life. Um, way beyond a th- any theater experience because it had multiple sensory uh, impact. You know, it wasn't just sound and sight. It was there. I, when it moved, its head created a bit of a disturbance in the air, and it, and I could smell it. Yeah, it smelled like latex, but I could smell it, yeah. you know, and I could feel the rumble of the hydraulic motors under my feet, and that was its pulse, you know. And, you know, to think that people won't do that anymore just made me go, you know, we got to at least give people a shot to know, number one, it's the funnest thing in the world, Number two, here's how you do it. And number three, it has value because it's still better. Yeah. It really is still better. Um, it's not as, uh, you know, it takes guts to say, yeah, we're going to commit a year ahead of time to building a giant <laughs> dinosaur. Yeah. But it works better. It just takes guts. Um, there's one There's one video where uh, your dad is talking, and I think it is about the T-Rex, where he's saying, you know, we're going to, I'm, I'm trying to, con- and he was like, even at that point, he said, I'm trying to convince Steven. It was all, you know, it was like, it was so like, like, like Steve was like, oh, I don't know. And then, and then you, you just document the entire building and it is like building a ship. I mean, the, the work that went into that and you got to think about all those little scales, all those little wrinkles in the, in the skin. That's all, that's, that's someone's hand doing that. Oh yeah. And you, and even if you're watching it and you know, it's a big robot, you also know it's real and yeah. it's and it weighs 20,000 pounds, and the people it's interacting with are actually in danger of being hurt by it if it goes out of control. There's that palpable thing. We just know it. We feel it, and we know it's there. We know it's not there. Um, well, but I- to take away from CG, honestly, Dad was a huge proponent, proponent of CG. He, he founded, uh, co-founded Digital Domain with James Cameron and Scott Ross, and he loved digital. But he felt that digital was an amazing complement just as practical was an amazing compliment, just as any other technique is an amazing compliment, amazing color or tool when used together effectively and, and uh, with art, uh, it can go beyond um, just a, a, a simple experience and actually move you into believing something is real. And I think that's been lost a little. We don't think things are real anymore. We know they're not real. Yeah. And I think it lo- films lose some of their visceral stakes. You know? Well, let me say this: like uh, we we went to see The Hobbit last night, and uh, you know, and I like Peter Jackson's movies, and I and I and I like this, but you know, there is just way too much motion capture, and see, I mean, you know, granted, the Golem is great, but it's then you get into the other stuff, like um, you know, the giant trolls or whatever they were. I mean, it's just it's just too goofy. I'm, I'm you know, and I'm a, I love cinema, and I I love CGI, but it's just. It's just too much, you know, and and it, the thing is, when you see um, you know vistas of thousands of monsters running across, it, it's all that power is lost. I think, you know, like I mean, I'm gonna stick up, I'm gonna stick up for Peter Jackson a little bit yeah. because I feel what he's done, um, especially I, I, I'm ashamed ashamed to say I haven't yet seen The Hobbit um, with the holidays. The Lord of the Rings I thought was fantastic in that he did incorporate. Tons of makeup effects. Oh, uh, yeah. you incorporate lots of lots of uh, stuff that helps sell the digital. Um, and if he's gone too far in the digital, then well, I'll have to see that for myself. But I do agree with you. I think that what has happened <laughs> is that the new generation who didn't grow up in the heyday of practical domination, you know, Rob Bottin's The Thing, right? Um, and also dad's work in that and all that heyday of when, Oh my God, look what's happening in front of our eyes. <laughs> and it's really there it's exploding and it's attacking them. And it's actually real blood. Um, they didn't grow up with that. They grew up with something that is more akin to a video game experience, right? Which though really fun and really visually engaging, 
doesn't for once fool you that it's there. But since you grew up with no other point of reference, it's still fun. It's entertaining. Sure. Um, but I think that those films that do come out that are using the blend better, uh, Real Steel, I thought, did it really well. You know, it, and you're in the corner with the robot, and it's live, and then it's in the ring, and it's digital. But you had that live moment that made you believe in it. So now this digital works better, and the digital um, is more mobile, and so it fills in with a practical, perhaps. So I see that coming back, and when it is used well, you feel it in your gut. You know it's there, and you're like, dang, that worked. That's why Iron Man, I, I really believe Iron Man, in addition to Robert Downey Jr.'s fantastic performance and the story in Favreau's direction, those suits were a perfect blend and I think people got a superhero movie they were looking for. That yeah. Kind of, um, yeah, I don't want to say I, you know, I, I'm, um, you know, that, I mean, I really do like some CG, but again, it is that the, this, the weightless thing, and it, it's even in the Hobbit there are scenes. But of course, that movie they had so much stuff going on in that movie. But I just do think that, and in, in, there's this trend in the big movies of they think you know if we see a million characters running across a field that that's more impressive than I, you know, I still think like, um, Orson Welles, um, the, was, I think it was, I can't remember, it was Macbeth or whatever. There's the, the battle scene, you know, it's just like 20 or 30 guys. And I think that, wow, that, or even like Spartacus or something, those guys are really there. And that has more weight and impact to me than seeing a million monsters running across the field. But you know, they're, they're bits and pixels and there's no, Person, sweaty, bodied person that needed to be feed at cra- fed at craft service. Whether, <laughs> yeah. whether or not they're acting, they are actually hot and sweaty and actually angry and actually could possibly trip during this shot. Right. And that's kind of exciting. Uh, I think that uh, what um, Ridley Scott did with Prometheus, and um, I, I know it has mixed reactions. I really liked it. I think once you I did too. get past it as an extension of the alien franchise because it's really not that it's a branch off of uh, you know and we all know basically but what i loved about that film is how much he used practical not only in the creature work um and the makeups those those uh, you know engineers were makeups i love them um they were odd and they were makeups uh yeah i was really surprised when uh, the severed head of the uh, of the engineer when i found out that that was a practical you know i just I, that blew me away yeah, sick animatronic head and and the the struggle in the uh surgery you know bed that awful surgical scene the yeah. the c sec oh my god i mean and it was a puppet it was a little rod puppet so simple but something that she could actually fight with in real time and um you know, and then obviously the digital enhanced that, and they just worked well. And what, but beyond that, he also built full sets. He also shot on location in Iceland. And nature, it's like nature will always give you more than you can recreate. You know, an actual pipe is a real pipe. A painting of a pipe, no, how, no matter how excellent it is, can never be a real pipe. Wow. And People get fascinated with the tools and look how close we can get. But, hey, hey, wait a second. Is any avatar of an actor ever going to be as real as just filming an actor? Yeah. I was thinking about, I think, I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, I think it's Shannon Shea, uh, one of the uh, instructors that you have. I think it's a tutorial. I mean, but he's he's moving, I believe, well, he's moving a puppet, uh, but he's u- using rods. Am I, is he, was he the one doing that in one of the things? He created a quick little uh, garage monster rod puppet, and he's just got simple, uh, you know, metal rods attached to this this little guy. I showed that to my wife that scene, and she says, "Why would anyone do CGI? You know, when you could do that because that's a guy actually." Oh, you know, it, it, it described the creature to me because we have it happen in two episodes. There was one where he's sort of a lizard-looking yes. like thing with some tribal adornments and a spear. Um, and then there's one where it's more of a snake-like, lizardy thing, uh, silicone, kind of shiny. Um, there's yeah. two of them. Yeah. E- either way, either way, an effective rod puppet is infinitely cheaper than the cheapest CGI character and can pull off so much um, that was not possible before rod removal became common. You know, you had to make a very complicated, very expensive animatronic. Now it's direct rod puppetry, direct to the main joints, 
The puppeteer is only six inches away. It's all organic because it's being driven by human muscle and bone. And you can remove the rods like this. It's fantastic for, for creatures. I would think for a director, you know, to be able to look through the camera and see it instantly and say, oh, no, let's do this or let's move this direction. You know what? Let's blow some smoke across it so the smoke flows across, you know, or whatever flows across it. Or let's have rain hitting it, you know. Just being able to see that live and instead of having it to be farmed out to... You know, a- it's you know what it is. It's the difference between going to a play and an improv show. Mm. Um, you know, when you're a filmmaker making a movie that is really reliant on post production, you have to map. Um, you know, you have to plan everything. The scene, there's no room for improvisation to a degree. Yeah. Uh, because we know the creature is going to bash through this room, and these chairs need to fall. Uh, but we can replace some of them digitally, but there's a certain amount of physical that has to happen. Let's just get that, and then we can put the creatures in. But when you have a creature on set, the director can ha- make anything happen. You know, I changed my – let's do a low angle here. Even though we storyboarded a, a wide angle, we are, we're, we're here in the moment. Just move the freaking camera. Yeah. And you know what? Let's – I don't want him to do that action. Let's have him do something new. You know, um, that was Dad's emphasis on, on the T-Rex and why the T-Rex was so special in addition to – um, being huge and kick-ass was that it could actually perform on cue. You know, Stephen could say, you know what, I don't want it to do that. Have him rear up his head and have him shake his head a little bit. And they and could do it, you know. And that was what made it truly special is it became, just like any other actor, a, a directable presence that would give you gifts that you didn't have plan for you know now let me let me there's a couple i just want there's like god there's like a million i could i know you you press for time there's a million things i could talk to you about but i just want to get these these things out um what i really think of your dad uh when i see scenes like when the t-rex is coming to the car and the little girl has the flashlight and it hits the uh, dinosaur's eye and his eye dilates you know, you remember that? <laughs> no, I, I, no, 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 hold it. Keep, keep describing it. Maybe it'll come back. Well, they, they're, they're trapped in the car. Kidding, please. What? <laughs> of course I, of course I. This, what this sounds like, I always sound like, um, you remember when Chris Farley used to do that interview show and he'd say, Hey, do you remember like, in? <laughs> yeah, I remember. It. Oh, it was cool. <laughs> I know. That's when your dad made Terminator and he was walking around the <laughs> station. That's yeah. why. That's why. Yeah, that that was awesome. I know that's what I sound like, and I feel bad for it. But, but I think about that 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 scene with the eye the eye dilating because that it, it that is a moment of like wow you know like someone thought of that you know someone had to think it someone had to make it and then also yeah. the scene and I I know it's Sam Neill saying it and I I'm not sure who you know who scripted it but there's the line where the guy says you know they do that thing where they have the um, uh, the impact radar where they're able to look for bones without, uh, um, yeah. And, and the guy says, pretty soon we won't even have to dig. And Sam Neill says, well, what's the fun in that? And I thought, wow, that's, that's like Stan Winston. That says it, that says it right there. Yeah. Why do it? Cause it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> that's good enough. And then what, what practical still has going for it to this day is that, when used properly with CG, it just gives you a better result. You just get a better result. Even digital artists, and I talked to a lot of them, and we're shooting lessons with them. They love starting from a starting point. You know, they really do. Yeah. Just to, to work from nothing, it's much easier for them to augment than to go from scratch. And, you know, yes, it might be frustrating in that you are held to a higher standard. You have to match something that actually exists in the real world. Um, but... You know, it keeps you honest. It, it's, uh, you know, anyway, it's... Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, 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 you're right. And, the, and, you know, we were putting together our core values as a company. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a family and friends that want to do something for Stan. And over the last three years, it's actually become a company. And we're having to create core standards. And then the, the number one thing on our list is fun. And it's in all caps because that's truly was the essence of what made Stan a successful and someone people wanted to, uh, to work with and, uh, create with and take chances with. So that's what, that's what we're trying to keep alive. And I, I just want to say, uh, I've talked to a lot of people about, uh, about CG and they said, not that a backlash, but I think th- there's a, there's a wave or a pendulum is swinging back 
to do more practical and more actual makeup, textural things, you know. And uh, I would say anybody, you know, stanwinstonschool.com is the place to go to, www.stanwinstonschool.com. And they have, um, uh, you guys have a, um, a YouTube channel that's just great stuff. There's a lot of stuff you put out for free that people can watch. And, uh, yeah, yeah, actually, I would say now uh, we're at about 80% of our content we're putting out now that we're putting out interviews and, and free mini lessons and, and uh, behind-the-scenes archival things. About 80% of what we're putting out is free. And uh, this is to share with you know the casual fan of all this stuff. And for those who, who do want to take it further, um, there's, there's plenty of free stuff as well, but, but you can always go deeper and get into our amazing tutorials with the best artists in the world. Um, so we're trying to cover our bases because so, everyone's a fan of monsters to some degree. Yeah. I, I have uh, some listeners that, um, you know, I've shared, I've either forwarded um, some of the stuff, like whoever does the, 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 fa- uh, the Facebook page of uh, the Stan Winston school is fantastic. So that, wh- that's all the people who run it. It's the five of us. Um, it was me for about two years and then it got big. <laughs> That okay, uh, head of production, David Sanger, you're going to learn how to be a Facebooker. Uh, my brother-in-law, Eric Lidoff, who's the co-founder, you're going to learn Facebook. It's, it's us. It's us who run the company. We do uh, all the Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube posts ourselves. You can tell there's a personality behind the post. It's like, hey, look at this picture. What, you know, and it's, like, it's almost like, how would you cap, you know, what would be the caption for this? Or, you know, and it, it really pulls in, um, you know, the, the Facebook fan and actually it's funny i will see something that you post and it'll be like i've seen it like it was posted five minutes ago and there'll be like eight thousand you know comments or or shares you know and i thought you know. I, I told the team because they were really hesitant about joining me in the social media fray because you know it did 20 year olds do that you know whatever yeah. Um, and I'm like, no, you know, the trick is that you, it's, it's you're hosting a party. We're hosting a party, and you're going to have fun with this. So finally they started putting together their own posts. And, you know, now I know that each one of us looks forward to our, our daily, you know, we work in a big shift, our daily sort of communication with the community, and we want it to be fun. We want it to be a moment of fun in your day. And that's what social media is so fantastic about is it lets you um, – have that feeling of engagement with people in real time. It's really fun. So again, there's that word fun. Yeah. We're using it. Well, um, and it, it, yeah, it's, it's all us. We do all that. Well, I think like, like your dad said, you know, if you do what you love and fun has to be in that, you know, the thing is, it's like, oh, if, oh, go if ahead. I'm having fun. What do you, how much how much time do you have on this planet? What do you waste? What are you doing? Yeah, I don't. You know? I, I think about um, the people that follow. They're going for money. They're, you know, and you're always going to be disappointed. I think because there was a time where I, you know, I was making good money, but it just never seemed like enough. No matter what money you're making, it never seems like enough. And especially, that's right. You know, if you're doing something, if you're in a, a, a job um, to please somebody else, or you're in a job just for the money, it's devastating. But if you could just do something that – now, here's the thing. I will, I will say um, you, to me, are as visionary as your father. And it, and it is possibly, you know, because you grew up with him and the way he – like you say, his, um, he had these mantras, the way he lived his life. But for me well, – Let me – there because that just gave me a little, like, heart stop. But just because he is my hero and honestly, if I could be a shadow of – the man, it would make me happy. So to hear you say that, that is like, whoa, well, careful now. Oh, well, no. That's just what well, that you're talking about. <laughs> I don't, I, I just mean as far as, um, you know, I don't know if he ever thought about doing the school, but here you took this and you're taking it into an area that he may not have ever thought about as far as like the Facebook and the, 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 you know, the Twittering and that kind of stuff and, and, and bringing you know, these, these great artists back to, to, you know, I think that is just, um, I don't know. I just think that's just well, incredible. And I think I, I, we just all have the benefit right now of living in a different time where distribution channels have, the old ones have broken down, and now you can put out content, you can grow a community, and you can share things without having some gatekeeper you have to get through. Hmm. And 
if the internet had been as democratized and as huge as it was, and the timing was right in his life, he certainly would have jumped on this. I mean, he was into everything, and that's what defined him. He was always looking for the next venue. Um, and he always loved education and, and dreamed of, you know, when things slow down, I just want to lecture. I want to travel the world and share these experiences. And so it was, it, the timing was off for him. But this is why we did pursue education, is we knew he, it was an, a thing that, a, a box he'd left unchecked, you know. And uh, so that came from him. And then I think our good fortune was to be, you know, coming up with the idea at a time when educating people online was becoming an acceptable uh, thing, you know. So it's a, it's good timing. Uh, we take no credit. Well, I, I was telling um, Steve Johnson, I interviewed him not too long ago, and I was telling him um, that when, when Dick Smith's 90th birthday, I think was it, I think it was his 90th birthday, uh, came around, I said, I'm going to do what I always wanted to do when I was a kid but never had the money. And that was like I was going to take his course. So on his birthday, I ordered the course. So I thought it would be like a gift to him <laughs> and a gift for myself. And uh, um, you know, That's the foundation for so many people in this business, that course right there. Yeah. And, and uh, I guess, you know, I, and, you know, not trying to be, I don't know, but I wanted to do it because, you know, he's 90 or 91 now. So I was like, uh, you know, how long, you know, you know hopefully – you know, he'll live forever, of course. But, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I did it while I can and while I could. And I was so sad when your dad passed away because I always thought I will, you know, I will meet him. I will, you know, one day maybe get, especially when I was talking to Steve Wang about, you know, the thing he said. He said that to Steve Wang about um, enjoying what you do. It's okay to, it's okay to have fun. And that's changed Steve's life. When I heard Steve say it on the video, on the tutorial, it changed my life. And I, I mean, I'm an adult. And uh, that's what this is about, is, is paying it forward, paying, paying the, the, the creative approach to life forward. For, and, and Dick Smith, I mean, you know, you mentioned it, and I, I know some young people getting into makeup who don't know the name, and I'm like shocked and aghast. Like, come on, he's a pillar, he's a foundation of, you got to know Jack Pierce, Lon Chaney, yeah. you got to know Tuttles, you got to know the Westmores, you got to know Dick Smith. You got to know. You got to know. And what we do know is that people will always be fascinated with monsters and with making things that are real. That will always hold fascination for human beings. We just have to make sure that the teachings of the founders are preserved and the crafts are preserved because innovation is impossible without uh, a foundation that you are building upon. You know, Steve Jobs rode on the shoulder of giants um, and innovated from there. And, you know, the next. Uh, amazing creations will come from people who are innovating uh, upon the foundation that we're helping to share. You know, so it's a it's a holy mission. Yeah. Well, I mean, when it, when I go to StanWinstonSchool dot com, he is alive. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. when, when I go there and I hear these other people talking, it is a great. I, I think people could go there that have no interest in makeup or special effects, and just. Life, life lesson. That's fantastic that you see that because that is what we see beyond just simple step by step how tos. It's what's what's said between the techniques that is so valuable. Um, wisdom about how to live the life of an artist and the risk you have to take and the attitude you have to have and how to collaborate. I mean, that's the value of what we're making because anyone can make how to videos, but what we're offering is access to. Uh, the best who've been doing this through the last decades and who have worked with the greatest artists and who've absorbed their teachings. I mean, these are guys who've brushed shoulders with Steven Spielberg and James Cameron and, and Guillermo del Toro on many occasions. And uh, so, yes, it's, there's something here for everyone if, if you are at all creatively inclined or, or even just love to be entertained by creatures. Um, uh, I'm glad it's working for you. We all thought it might, and it's nice to get the reception we've gotten and see that it's not just us who, who feel this is worthy of uh, carrying on. We've it's, been it's, talking with Matt Winston, the son of Stan Winston, and uh, he runs, uh, along with the entire family, which is great, family and friends, stanwinstonschool.com. Check it out. It's also uh, the Stan Winston School of the Arts. I want to go. I want to I do this because I, you know, I feel like I missed out um, – you know, 
they, they, I'll, be, I'll be honest. Uh, I used to be married to a woman that did feature publicity for Universal. So I used to go on this, the lot quite a bit. I could actually get on the lot without having to get a pass because one time – my uh, ex-wife, uh, she had a shoe that broke, but one of the heels broke on her shoes. So she, it was like an emergency. So she called the guard, and it was the guard in the back entrance, not the main entrance, but uh, I forgot what, what, what the back entrance was called. But he thought it was the funniest thing in the world that I had to come and bring a pair of shoes to my wife, that no matter when I went there, they would just wave me in. And uh, one day um, I, I got to walk. Um, it, was the, um, it was the Lost World set. And I just walked in there. There was nobody there. I just walked around the sets, you know, which is a big no-no. But I, I, I did have these fantasies that I would run in, you know, uh, you know, run into your father. And, and I know people that knew him, and I always wanted, you know, to meet him. But I can go, go to the school, and he's there. He, it's alive. It's a living thing. It's not like, you know, when I say tutorials, it's just, it's, that sounds so cold. It's not cold at all. These interviews are fun. These uh, instructors have personalities of their own and there's just this great love and things get passed around i just hope um, more of my listeners uh check it out and um i just well thank you so much jerry for helping us bang the drum um it's it's nice when the thing that you're shouting uh, about is so much fun because it's it's really worthy of being shared it's just fun man it's like yeah. <laughs> fantasy and characters and art and you know it's awesome and I'm glad that you feel Stan alive in it because that was the very first thing that inspired all of us. We missed the guy. Yeah. And now you click on teachers and he's the very first teacher you see. And his teachings are all over the place and, and from his own mouth and from those that uh, he worked with. So um, it's uh, thank you for helping us spread the word. Oh, thank you so much. And um, so so for all this, uh, you have to add me as a Facebook friend. Thanks for thanks for doing this show. And uh, if there's anything you got coming out or any kind of – Don Lanning, who's one of our great sculptors, uh, his lesson released today. We've got a uh, um, T-800 uh, Terminator 2 uh, behind-the-scenes video in the works that's coming out uh, next week. We've got a Predator 2 uh, behind-the-scenes coming out in three weeks. Uh, we have uh, another lesson with Alec Gillis, a mold-making lesson coming out at the end of the month, and all kinds of uh, interviews and, and all kinds of good stuff. So we've got like eight releases this month. So. Oh, fantastic. Um, I guess I, I just want um, the listeners to know that they can sign up. You can actually um, sign up to the Stan Winston School of the Arts without actually – you don't have to enroll in the school yet, but I, I guarantee you once you – There's a free sign-up, and that will just keep you in the loop about what we're doing, and you'll, you'll be able to explore the site. Uh, we have a lot of free content to look at. And if, you're, if you dig it, then uh, you can become a subscriber, but um, there's a lot to look at. Sometimes you have these deals that come out. You, you have these emails and these promos that uh, are fantastic. So I would say get in there, get your name in, start receiving the posts, and uh, and you'll never know what kind of surprise will. You yeah, know. You'll, you'll hear about all the goodies when everyone else does. So Matt, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Jerry, and I, I look forward to talking to you whenever. Your, uh, your passion is so palpable. So it's always a pleasure to talk to someone who gets it, you know. Woo! <laughs>